Hello. Welcome to another reading of Two Years Before the Mast. I will review a little bit of Chapter 4. Uh, we saw basically how, how much work goes into, you know, being chased after by a pirate ship. Uh, speed won the day and they were able to get away. So, uh, get away from that one. And there was indeed a Carolina, at least he thinks there was a Carolina that they met up with on the 21st of August. They have a new second mate, Jim Hall. Uh, he is now uh, the one taking care of uh, cooking and all of that. So that's new. And we will go on because this is a little lengthy chapter, uh, chapter five. Chapter five, Cape Horn, a visit. Wednesday, November 5th. The weather was fine during the previous night, and we had a clear view of the Magellan Clouds and of the Southern Cross. The Magellan Clouds consist of three small nebula in the southern part of the heavens, two bright, like the Milky Way, and one dark. These are first seen just above the horizon soon after crossing the southern tropic. When off Cape Horn, they are nearly overhead. The cross is composed of four stars in that form and is said to be the brightest constellation in the heavens. During the first part of this day, Wednesday, the wind was light, but after noon, it came on fresh and we furled the royals. We still kept the studding sails out and the captain said he should go round with them if he could just before eight o'clock then about sundown in that latitude the cry of all hands ahoy was sounded down and for scuttle and after hatchway and hurrying upon deck we found a large black cloud rolling on towards us from the southwest and blackening the whole heavens. Here comes Cape Horn, said the chief mate, and we had hardly time to haul down and crew up before it was upon us. In a few moments, a heavier sea was raised than I had ever seen before, and it was directly ahead. The little brig, which was no better than a bathing machine, plunged into it, and all the forward parts of her was under water. The sea pouring in through the bow ports and house hole and over the, the night heads threatening to wash everything overboard. In the lee scuppers, it was up on a man's waist. We sprang aloft and double reefed the top sails and furled all the other sails and made all snug. But this would not do. The brig was laboring and straining against the head sea and the gale was growing worse and worse. At the same time, sleet and hail were driving with all fury against us. We clued down and hauled out the reef tackles again and close reefed the fore top sail and furled the main and hove her to on the starboard tack. Here was an end to our fine prospects. We made up our minds to head winds and cold weather, sent down the royal yards and unrove the gear, 
but all the rest of the top hamper remained aloft even to the sky sail mast and studding sail booms. Throughout the night it stormed violently, rain, hail, snow, and sleet beating upon the vessel. The wind continued ahead and the sea running high. At daybreak, about 3 a.m., the deck was covered with snow. The captain sent up the steward with a glass of grog to each of the watch. And all the time that we were off the Cape, grog was given to the morning watch and to all hands whenever we reefed topsails. The clouds cleared away at sunrise and the wind becoming more fair, we again made sail and stood nearly upon to our course. Thursday, November 6. It continued more pleasant through the first part of the day, but at night we had the same scene over again. This time we did not heave to as on the night before, but endeavored to beat to windward under close reef topsails, balance reef trysail, and fore top mast staysail. This night it was my turn to steer, or as the sailors say, my trick at the helm for two hours, inexperienced as I was. I made out to steer to the satisfaction of the officer, and neither Stimson nor myself gave up our tricks all the time that we were off the cave. This was something to boost of, boast of, for it required a good deal of skill and watchfulness to steer a vessel close hauled in a gale of wind against a heavy head sea. Ease her when she pitches, is the word, and a little carelessness in letting her ship a, a heavy sea might sweep the decks and knock the mass out of her. Friday, November 7th. Towards morning, the wind went down and during the whole forenoon, we lay tossing about in a dead calm and in the midst of a thick fog. The calms are unlike those in most parts of the world, for there is always a high sea running and the periods of calm are so short that it has no time to go down and vessels being under no command of sails or rudder lie like logs upon the water. We were obliged to steady the booms and yards by guys and braces and to lash everything well below. We now found our top hamper of some use. For though it is liable to be carried away or sprung by the sudden bringing up of a vessel when pitching in a chopping sea, yet it is a great help in steadying a vessel when rolling in a long swell, giving more slowness, ease, and regularity to the motion. The calm of the morning reminds me of a scene which I forgot to describe at the time of its occurrence, but which I remember from its being the first time that I had heard the near breathing of whales. It was on the night that we passed between the Falkland Islands and Staten Land. We had the watch from 12 to 4, and coming upon deck, found the little brig lying perfectly still, surrounded by a thick fog, and the sea as smooth as though oil had poured, been poured upon it. 
Yet now and then a long, low swell rolling under its surface, slightly lifting the vessel, but without breaking the glassy smoothness of the water. We were surrounded far and near by shoals of sluggish whales and grumpuses. Grumpuses are also dolphins. That's probably what he meant which the fog prevented our seeing rising slowly to the surface, or perhaps lying out at length, heaving out those peculiar lazy deep and long drawn breathings, which give such an impression of sepinous and strength. Some of the watch were asleep and the others were perfectly still, so that there was nothing to break the illusion, and I stood leaning over the bulwarks, bulwarks, listening to the slow breathings of the mighty creatures, now one breaking the water just alongside, whose black body I almost fancied that I could see through the fog, and again another, which I could just hear in the distance, until the low and regular swell seemed like the heaving of the ocean's mighty bosom to the sound of its heavy and long-drawn respirations. Towards the evening of this day, Friday 7th, the fog cleared off, and we had every appearance of a cold blow, and soon after sundown it came on again, it was a clue up and haul down, reef and furl, until we had got her down to close reef topsails, double reefed trysail, and reefed for Spencer. Snow, hail, and sleet were driving upon us most of the night, and the sea breaking over the bows and covering the forward part of the little vessel. But as she would lay her course, the captain refused to heave her to. Saturday, November 8th. This day commenced with calm and thick fog and ended with hail, snow, a violent wind, and close reefed top sails. Sunday, November 9th. Today, the sun rose clear and continued so until 12 o'clock when the captain got an observation. This was very well for Cape Horn, and we thought it a little remarkable that we had not had one unpleasant Sunday during the whole voyage. The only tolerable day here should be a Sunday. We got time to clear up the steerage and forecastle and set things to rights and to overhaul our wet clothes a little, but this did not last very long. Between five and six, the sun was nearly three hours high. The cry of, all starboard lines ahoy! summoned our watch on deck, and immediately all hands were called. A true specimen of Cape Horn was coming upon us. A great cloud of a dark slate color was driving on us from the southwest, and we did our best to take in sail. For the light sails had been set during the first part of the day, before we were in the midst of it. We had got the light sails furled, the courses hauled up, and the top sail reef tackled, hauled out, and were just mounting the fore rigging when the storm struck us. In an instant, the sea, which had been comparatively quiet, was running higher and higher, and it became almost as dark as night. The hail and sleep were harder than I had felt them. 
seeming ominous to pin us down to the rigging. We were longer taking and sail than ever before, for the sails were swift and wet, the ropes and rigging covering, covered with snow and sleep, and we ourselves cold and nearly blinded with the violence of the storm. By the time we had got down upon deck again, the little brig was plunging madly into a tremendous head sea, which at every drive rushed in through the bow ports and over the bows and buried all the forward part of the vessel. At this instant, the chief mate, who was standing on top of the windlass, at the foot of the spencer mast called out, Lay out there and furl the jib. This was no agreeable or safe duty, yet it must be done. An old Swede, the best sailor on board, who belonged on the forecastle, sprang upon, out upon the bow spirit. Another one must go, I was near the mate and sprang forward and threw the downhaul over the windlass and jumped between the night heads out upon the bowsprit. The crew stood abaft the windlass and hauled the jib down while we got out upon the weather side of the jib boom. Our feet on the foot ropes, holding on by the spar, the great jib flying off to leeward and slatting, so as almost to throw us off of the boom. For some time, we could do nothing but hold on, and the vessel driving into two huge seas, one after the other, plunging us twice into the water, up to our chins. We hardly knew whether we were on or off. When coming up, dripping from the water, we were raised high into the air. John, that was the sailor's name, thought the boom would go every moment and called out to the mate to keep the vessel off and haul down the staysail, but the fury of the wind and the breaking of the seas against the bows defied every attempt to make ourselves heard, and we were obliged to do the best we could in our situation. Fortunately, no other seas so heavy struck her, and we succeeded in furling the jib, quote, after a fashion, end quote and coming in over the staysails, nettings, were not a little pleased to find that all was snug and the watch gone below, for we were soaked through and it was very cold. The weather continued nearly the same through the night. Monday, November 10th. During a part of this day, we were hove to but the rest of the time we're driving on under close reef sails with a heavy sea, a strong gale, and frequent squalls of hail and snow. Tuesday, November 11th, the same. Wednesday, the same. Thursday, the same. We had now got hardened to Cape weather. The vessel was under reduced sail and everything secured on deck and below so that we had little to do but to steer and to stand our watch. Our clothes were all wet through and only change was from wet to more wet. It was in vain to think of reading or working below, for we were too tired. The hatchways were closed down and everything was wet and uncomfortable, black and dirty, heaving and pitching. 
We had only to come below when the watch was out. Bring out our wet clothes, hang them up, and turn in and sleep as soundly as we could until the watch was called again. The sailor can sleep anywhere. No sound of wind, water, wood, or iron can keep him awake. And we were always fast asleep and three blows on the hatchway and the unwelcome cry of all starboard lines ahoy eight bells there below do you hear the news the usual formula of calling the watch roused us up from our berths upon the cold wet decks the only time when we could he said to take any pleasure was at night and morning when we were allowed a tin pot full of hot tea or as the sailors significantly called it water bewitched sweetened with molasses this was his uh, recipe he has of uh, rum with cocoa it's like hot cocoa and rum this, bad as it was, was still warm and comforting, and together with our sea biscuit and cold salt beef made quite a meal. Yet, even this meal was attended with some uncertainty. We had to go ourselves to the galley and take our kid of beef and 10 pots of tea and run the risk of losing them before we could get below. Many a kid of beef have I seen rolling in the scuppers and the bearer lying at his length on the decks. I remember an English lad who was always the life of the crew, but whom we afterwards lost overboard, standing for 10 minutes at the galley with his pot of tea in his hand, waiting for a chance to get down into the forecastle and seeing what he thought was a smooth spell started to go forward. He had just got to the end of the windlass when a great sea broke over the bows and for a moment I saw nothing of him but his head and shoulders and at the next instance being taken off his legs, he was carried aft with the sea until his stern lifting up and sending the water forward, he was left high and dry at the side of the long bed, still holding on to his tin pot, which had now nothing in it but salt water, but nothing could ever daunt him or overcome for a moment his habitual good humor, regaining his legs and shaking his fist at the man at the wheel. He rolled below, staying as he passed, a man's no sailor if you can't take a joke. The ducking was not the worst of such an affair for as there was no allowance, well, it was an allowance of tea, you could get no more from the galley. And though the sailors would never suffer a man to go without, but would always turn in a little from their own pots to fill up his. Yet this was at best but dividing the loss among all hands. Something of the same kind befell me a few days after. The cook had just made for us a mess of hot scouse, that is biscuit pounded fine, salt beef cut into small pieces, and a few potatoes boiled up together and seasoned with pepper. This was a rare treat, and I, being the last at the galley, had it put in my charge to carry down for the mess. I got along very well as far as the hatchway 
and was just getting down the steps when a heavy sea, lifting the stern out of the water and passing forward, dropping it down again through the steps from their place, and I came down into the steerage a little faster than I meant to, with the kid on top of me and the whole precious mess scattered over the floor. Whatever your feelings may be, you must make a joke of everything at sea. And if you were to fall from a loft and be caught in the belly of a sail and thus saved from instant death, it could not do to look at all disturbed or to make a serious matter of it. Friday, November 14th. We were now well to the westward of the Cape, and were changing our course to the northward as much as we dared since the strong southwest winds which prevailed then carried us in towards Patagonia. At 2 p.m. we saw a sail on our larboard beam, and at 4 we made it out to be a large ship steering our course under single reef topsails. We, at the same time, had shaken the reefs out of our topsails as the wind was lighter and set the main top gallant sail. As soon as our captain saw what sail she was under, he set the fore top gallant sail and flying jib, and the old whaler for such his boats and short sails showed him to be, felt a little ashamed and shook the reefs out of his topsail, but could do no more, for he had sent down his top gallant mast off the cape. He ran down for us and answered our hail as the whale ship, New England of Poughkeepsie, 120 days from New York. Our captain gave our name and added 92 days from Boston. They then had a little convergent conversation about longitude in which they found that they could not agree. The ship fell astern and continued in sight during the night. Toward morning, the wind having become light, we crossed our royal and sky sail yards, and at daylight, we were seen under a cloud of sail, having royals and sky sails fore and aft. The spouter, as the sailors call a whaleman, had sent out his main top gallant mast and set the sail and made signal for us to heave to. About half past seven, their whale boat came alongside and Captain Job Terry sprang on board, a man known in every port and every vessel in the Pacific Ocean. Don't you know Job Terry? I thought everybody knew Job Terry, said a green hand who came in the boat to me when I asked him about his captain. He was indeed a singular man. He was six feet high, wore thick cowhide boots and brown coat and trousers, and except a sunburnt complexion, had not the slightest appearance of a sailor. Yet he had been 40 years in the whale trade and he said himself had owned ships, built ships, and sailed ships. His boat's crew were a pretty raw set, just set out of the bush, and as the sailors phrase it, quote, hadn't got the hayseed out of their hair, end quote. Captain Terry convinced our captain that our reckoning 
was a little out, and having spent the day on board, put off in his boat at sunset for his ship, which was now six or eight miles astern. He began a yarn when he came aboard, which lasted with but little intermission for four hours. It was all about himself and the Peruvian government and the Dublin frigate and Lord James Townsend and President Jackson and the ship Anne M. Kim of Baltimore. It would probably never have come to an end had not a good breeze sprung up which sent him off to his own vessel. One of the lads who came in his boat, a thoroughly countrified looking fellow, seemed to care very little about the vessel, rigging or anything else, but went round looking at the livestock and leaning over the pigsty and said he wished he was back again tending his father's pigs. At eight o'clock, we altered our course to the northward bound for Juan Fernandez. This day, we saw the last of the albatrosses, which had been our companions a great part of the time off the Cape. I had been interested in the bird from descriptions which I read of it and was not at all disappointed. We caught one or two.